The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa in the mid-90s, I believe, is one of the most amazing events of the last century of human history. That it happened continues to give me hope that we are indeed capable of making decisions to follow Jesus as, as a group, as a whole people, that we can decide to do what is faithful. Desmond Tutu tells the story of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness. It's the story of the time after the fall of apartheid in South Africa, the nation of South Africa. There was a system of apartheid for about 50 years in which a white minority oppressed and subjugated a, a black majority. And I won't share with you the details of what that looked like, but I, they're frankly not uh, PG-13. I can tell you what a necklace is after worship if you want to know how bad it got. When apartheid fell, in large part due to the nonviolent resistance of the church, joined with the other major political party that might surprise you, the Communist South African Party, uh, they worked together to bring about the fall of apartheid. The uh, government that replaced the apartheid government, led by Nelson Mandela, had a challenging decision to make. Would it forget its past to pretend it never happened? Well, that would not work. For if the past is not grappled with, it will fester and doom the future. The other obvious option was to seek a judicial solution, like the trial at Nuremberg after World War II, put people on trial and convict them. But what was quickly realized is that mamas did not want to know who to blame first. First, they wanted to know where their children were buried. And as soon as you start, talk, start talking about trials, everyone would clam up, and the truth would not be told. And so they found a third way. Based on a deep commitment and conviction that peacemaking is the will of God, though it is not easy, it is often messy and awkward, they did it anyways. They opened themselves up as a nation to hearing and to listening. And over the course of two years, those who had been on the receiving end told their stories and were heard. And those who had been perpetrators, whether white or black, told their stories as well. For some, reparations were made. For others, amnesty was granted. And overall, the truth was told. Now, it was not perfect. If you go and look up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission today, as I did yesterday on Google, just to see what comes up, you will find plenty of people who critique the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It didn't go far enough. It should have done this. It should have done that. But it is important to realize that what it was was a faithful response in a hard situation it was not perfect but there are very few situations where the options are between imperfect and perfect the options are often between bad and worse or good and better they, they did the best and most faithful thing they could in that moment and in doing so received and accepted the, the a slice of the kingdom of god in their midst they took the church on the road and they churched their way through a problem and now south, south africa stands as a nation because of it Last week we spoke about the combination of forgiveness and justice, that is the message of Easter. Forgiveness which frees people from the brokenness of the past, but is, has to be joined to justice. For justice is, is the hope and the conviction that we are heading towards a future that is God's kingdom, in which all will be made right. Forgiveness frees us from the brokenness of what was. The promise of the kingdom of God gives us hope for the future that will be. Humanity reconciled with itself. God reconciled with humanity and creation at peace. As we hear in the scriptures today, as Jesus celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples, he says, I will not drink of the vine. He has just blessed the cup of the, the communion, the wine, and shared that. And he tells his disciples, I will not drink this again until I drink it with you in the kingdom to come. Jesus yearns for this justice that is to come. He's waiting. He's holding up the party till we get there. Right? And we read in Corinthians, as Paul describes, whenever we gather at this table, we are gathered gathering and proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. And we again, we gather with Jesus at the table when all will be made right, all will be made just. Now, the good news is we're heading there. The hard news is that we're going to get there and getting there is always a challenge. 
right? To, fit, to be on the road, to, to talk about where we're landing, that, that's simple in a sense and beautiful. Here's the kingdom of God. But we're over here. And if this is A and this is D, what is B and C? What are the intermediary steps? What are the steps we take in this space where we're not going to get to the kingdom of God this week? We might. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not planning on it, right? And so if we don't expect the kingdom of God to come in its fullness tomorrow, all of Revelation happening tomorrow, then if we're here, we've got to figure out how do we get from A to B? What does that look like? And these are the types of decisions that are intrinsically frustrating because you know where you want to land, but you got to figure out what's the first step in getting there. It's like those TV shows where they find like a, a 1969 Mustang that's been in the garage for a long time and it's rusted out. And you can see in your head what it's going to look like once it's fully restored, but you got to figure out where you're going to start. And when something's in that much trouble, like where do you start? Do you start on the transmission? Do you start on the body work? Do you start on the, the, the brakes? Like where do you start? And, and by definition, as soon as you choose one place to start, you're not working on the rest because you can't do everything at once. You've got to choose one thing to take a swing at. And we live in a culture where we have a few problems in our culture. I don't think I'm surprising anyone when I say that, right? There's no, that's not a big surprise. Like, I look across the, our, the culture we live in, and as of this year, the bottom half of Americans, 50%, own 1.1% of the wealth of America. We have a wealth distribution problem. Like, farmers. Anyone think farmers are paid enough for what they do? Like, for a farmer to ever have to worry whether he, is going to, he or she is going to have enough food to eat is a sin. Like, that's wrong. It, we deal with the repercussions of, of racism still. The average black family has a wealth of $7,000. The average white family has a wealth of $112,000. We, we grapple with these lingering issues. Prisons are being run for profit, which means we have no incentive to ever lower the number of people in them. And anyone think that the teachers are adequately uh, paid or schools are adequately funded? Okay, that was a gimme. I know my crowd. No one's going to say anything about that. <laughs> But, like, none of this is how it should be. These things are wrong. Right? That's where we're at right now at A. We know that's not how we're going to be when we get to D, when we get to the kingdom of God. But, like, what is B? What's the next step? Where do we get involved, get in the trenches, and start grappling with something? Now, some of what you grapple with is determined by location. If we were a church in Moberly, you know, there's a big prison down there, right? And, and so maybe that would be location-driven. We would say, let us go and make sure we are the place where felons have a place to put their lives back together. But as it is, we're nowhere near a prison, right? So that's not what we're going to do. But what we are looking for is the place where the needs of the community intersect with our ability to do something. That, that is, that's our calling. And whatever we're going to take a swing at, once we say this is our calling, that means we're, we're going to do this, but we're not going to do that. Like, for example, if we say, this church, we are going to work towards the healing of broken families. We can't solve everything, but we can make sure that there is plenty of people to adopt. We can support foster care, and we can work with our local schools to make sure every child we can contact knows that they are a child of God, made in the very image of God, and they are loved. Right? We could do that. And you know what we would do? If we did that, you know what we wouldn't be doing as well? We would not be working on transient poverty or business development or job creation, the other challenges this community faces. That's part of the challenge. If we're going from here to there, you can only do one thing at a time. And so we, if we choose to do the work with the families, there's so much we're not going to do. But we have to do something. To do nothing is disobedience to Christ, who tells us to love our neighbor. To try to do everything is to try to take Jesus' place. To say that we're going to do something is to say that we're going to take this step towards the kingdom and trust that others, other people, other churches will also respond. And this is what we do. We trust others to do what they can. And to trust that others will do what they can do 
is, is a challenge at times. Because to trust other people to do what obviously we know how to do, right? Because I, if you, I want to do it right, so I'll do it. Well, you can only do so much. Right? To trust others to do what is also important is a challenge. Because what seems obvious to us, this is what we should focus on as a community. Other people in the community, they think something else is obvious. And, and this is part of the humility that is needed as we seek the kingdom of God. To, to accept that we will, with great fervor, seek out what is obvious to us. And, and there are other churches and other parts of the community who will approach it differently. As long as we are headed towards the same goal, the kingdom of God... That's okay. As long as we are seeking this goal in Christ-like means and in Christ, towards Christ-like ends. This ends up being somewhat of the challenge. Is that no matter what we pursue, you can't get from here to here and get here to get to a Christ-like end by non-Christ-like means. Right? If, we, if we try to be faithful to Jesus and do it in ways that aren't in line with how Jesus lived, we're not actually getting very far. This is the same, and we see this in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? Jesus was the Prince of Peace. And so he used force, persuasion, right? He, he used power to get his way, his way being the, the right way, obviously, Son of God and all. But he did not use violence, because when you use violence, you create winners and losers, and the losers of today come back and fight tomorrow. And, and that was the realization that they made. If they tried to create winners and losers, they would still be having fights. And, and when Jesus goes to serve, he doesn't want winners and losers, he wants neighbors. Because no matter what happens, you're still going to be neighbors come tomorrow. There is one last aspect of the nature of living in this transitional time between here and here that I, I want to make sure to address. There are two temptations that we have to face. The first temptation is the temptation when everything is going well, when everything seems to be hunky-dory, when everything is great. The temptation is to think that we can do it all ourselves, right? And, and, and the prophet Amos reminds us then that we always still need the power of God. We cannot do it ourselves. We accept and receive what God has to offer. The other temptation is when things are going badly. The temptation there is to believe that we're never going to get there. Things are so bad, how can we ever make progress? And this is where, like we read in Scripture, the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, when they come back from the, from the uh, exile, they're reminded that even though things are hard, you take what steps you can and you trust that God will get us there in the end. Because in the end, getting to the kingdom of God is like crossing a pond in a paddle boat. You all know the paddle boat? Two people start paddling. You ever get in a paddle boat with your dad? Right? And you're trying to paddle for all you can, but you can barely touch the wheels. Who's really getting you there? Your dad. Right? You're along for the ride, and you enjoy it, and you're glad to be helping and working with your dad. But let's be clear, it's your dad who gets you there. That's how we're getting to the kingdom of God. We jump in the paddle boat, and we paddle as hard as we can with Jesus Christ our Lord. But in the end, it's Jesus who gets us there, and we're just happy to be able to be part of it. The punchline of this sermon ends up being the same as last Sunday and then the Sunday before at Easter and really every Sunday. The punchline is that we offer forgiveness and justice here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we offer forgiveness and justice. Forgiveness to deal with the brokenness of the past, the promise of justice to deal with the promise of the future. Our calling as a church is to be the place where the future is already full, the end is already written. So we do not have to earn the future, deserve it, or build it. We accept it. We accept that we are forgiven. We accept that the future is already full, that there will be justice in the kingdom of God that is to come. That we will take the steps we can take now, but it is the power of Jesus Christ and the resurrection that will get us to where we're going to end up. We graciously accept that being together as a church is how we begin to experience that today. Thanks be to God. Amen.